Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari to our three schools, Shelton Park Elementary, Gimpsville Meadows Elementary, and SeaTac Elementary Schools, all in the United States, kids aged six to eight, and, of course, all of our regular viewers, hello and welcome to uh, the Lowfelt of South Africa. My name is James Henry. And we have got Senzo and Kese on the camera today, and we've got two other teams out today. One of them led by Ralph and Fergus, and the other is Taylor and Viam, and they are walking around on foot. Now, what we have here is a very special animal known as an impala. And you can ask us any questions you like through your teacher. You just ask your teacher, and she will send the he or he will send the question through to what we call the final control, and that will go straight into my ear, and I will be able to answer anything that you have. And if I don't know the answer, well, then we'll have to find out for you. So this impala is our most common antelope, and he's all on his own. Do you see that? He's got no friends at all. Uh, he's got no friends only because it's April. That's this time of the year. And in April and May, the impalas don't have friends, the males. They fight with each other because very soon they will try and make what we call a territory. Now, a territory, I'm just going to move a little bit forward. A territory is a space where they don't want any other male impala and in which they will try and keep all of their females so he will have lots of wives if he's very lucky sometime in the next little while and this area close to water and with good grass will be his territory now italiana you are interested in what this fellow might eat well if you look at him he's not eating very much at the moment is he that's because he's looking for possible intruders or invaders into his territory but he's standing all over his food he eats grass so if he gets hungry all he needs to do is put his head down onto the ground and start to eat grass and he can also eat the leaves off trees which is quite nice he's a magnificent animal okay we're going to head down towards a little water hole not far from here while we do that let's go and meet taylor who's walking around on foot Good afternoon, good afternoon. It's great to have you on Bushwalk with me today. My name is Taylor, just like James said, and on camera with me today is Viam. And it's very, very exciting to be out here, and I hope that you're all ready to learn lots about animals. So, if you have any questions, remember to ask your teacher. Now, I have seen my favorite, one of my favorite animals, and one of the coolest animals to see on foot, but it's pretending to be a tree at the moment. It's very, very far away. Let's see if any of you managed to get the name of this animal correct. So what animal are you shouting out at the moment? Is it giraffe? I hope it is a giraffe because that's what we've got standing in the very, very far distance. And we're going to see how close we can sneak up to this giraffe. Well, I suppose there won't be much sneaking done because giraffe have got very, very good eyesight. And I think that he's already seen us from this distance. They can see for a very, very long way away. And you've got to be extremely good. You've got to have the stealth of a leopard stalking through the grass, creeping nice and low in order to get close to a giraffe. Now, Coco, you've just asked if these types of animals live with predators. And do they live in the same habitat? Yes. So there are lots and lots of different animals out here. So not just giraffe, but we've got elephants and impala, which is a type of antelope, kudu and zebra and warthogs. You may remember Pumba from the Lion King. There are lots of those too. And those animals are all living out here looking And they look around because they are looking out for predators. So just like VM is doing, as always, like a meerkat, like Timon from The Lion King, looking around. The lions, leopards, hyenas, they all want to eat those animals. Now, a giraffe is very, very tall. I bet you all agree. So Italiano, you've asked, what do giraffe eat? Well, they've got these very, very, very long necks so that they can stretch right up to the tops of the trees and eat the leaves. So they are eating leaves. So we call those 
browsers. We call animals that just eat grass, grazers. So sometimes though, the giraffe can be a little bit confusing because you'll see them standing like this with their legs wide open and they'll be eating on the ground and you think, why are they eating grass? But they're not. They'll be eating little plants like this, little shrubs that are growing down that are still quite small. Sometimes a giraffe like a challenge. But there's one more person that's out on safari and he's got some cool gadgets in his car. His name is Ralph. Let's go say hello to him. Well, thank you everybody and welcome aboard the afternoon sunset safari. You're with Safari Live and my name is Ralph Kirsten and on board as my wingman cameraman, we've got Fergus. How's it Fergus? Now, thanks for joining us and don't forget to send your questions through your teacher's kitties and uh, that's going to come through and we'd love for you to join us and we'll answer all your questions and your comments. Now, we've got our drone up in the air, the eye in the sky. We're not going to go across to it just yet but uh, we're going to be heading forward and uh, Alexis I feel absolutely 100% safe in my Jeep even though that we don't have a door here um, that's not a problem because animals see this vehicle as a whole and um, and and it's quite big so they they're not really worried about us and they're quite used to it as well I think they just believe it's that big green smelly animal on its way again and they sort of move out of the way but they do come very close to the vehicle quite regularly Regularly. And um, I'm going to start up, I'm moving in the direction where we, we did see an, a leopard earlier this morning and there's also some elephants in the area. And so while we do that, I'm going to head you back over to James with one of those little animals that like wallowing in the mud. They do like wallowing in mud. These are our own very special type of African pig and they are called warthogs. Now if you look on their faces there, on that big boar's face, you can see he's got four big warts. And that's where they get their name, warthog. And this is a boar, that means he's a male or a man warthog. He's big and strong. And you know he can weigh about 220 pounds. A really big one. That's really heavy for something that small. And there are a few others there, probably his wife and maybe his two children. Normally he doesn't hang around with the children, but obviously that one is a very good father, so he's staying with his kids. There's a youngster. Now, Italiana, you want to know if those warthogs are going to hunt anything. No, they are not going to hunt anything at all. Those warthogs are herbivores. That means they eat grass and leaves and fruits, and sometimes they will eat rotting flesh. So they might find something dead, and then they might eat a little bit of its bones. But normally, they only eat vegetables. Now, this is a big water buck. That is a water buck. I'll quickly answer Aubrey's question about why warthogs like those ones have tusks. It's simply to protect themselves. Remember they're quite small which means they're very tasty for hyenas and leopards and lions and animals like that and so they need to protect themselves and that's why they've got those tusks. There we have a water buck like I said and look at his horns. His horns are used to defend himself and for fighting with other male waterbuck. Isn't that amazing? They're like two huge swords on the top of his head. He's a big fellow. And he's hanging around with some impala. Remember we met the impala earlier on? He's hanging around with them because they are very good at spotting predators. So they might see a lion coming here, or a leopard, or a hyena, and then they will tell the water buck. They'll go, <coughs> <coughs> and that will tell the water buck that there's danger nearby. Oh, and there's a very small water buck over there. Look how sweet he is. Look at this tiny, tiny, sweet little warthog. 
Not water, hog, water buck. Isn't he sweet? Two little babies and their mothers, and possibly their father as well, just behind that bush. There we are. Anthony, you're wondering how many animals I've heard alarm call today. Well, I've heard some baboons alarm calling, I've heard some birds alarm calling, three or four different kinds of birds, and some squirrels. So I think I've heard about five or six animals making an alarm call. Now, oh, this is interesting. Look what's going on here. The male waterbucks are making noises at each other, and the one is following that female very carefully, which says that maybe she's ready to be a mother again. Now, these two males might fight with each other, because they will both want to be the father of her next baby. And you can see the one with the big horns, even though he's got bigger horns, he's run away from the first water buck we saw. So he's scared. Aubrey, you're asking me, do little water bucks have horns? Well, Aubrey, you were looking at the little water bucks. Can you see any horns on them? I can't see any horns on them. The female water bucks will never get horns, but the males will eventually get horns, probably start their horn growth at about six months. Now, Jaden, you've asked a very sophisticated question about what animals are related to water bucks like these ones. Well, the most common one is known as a lechwe. A lechwe, and you don't find them here, you find them up in Botswana, and then you'll get something uh, known as a cob, they're closely related, and they'll be found in a place like the Sudan. So they're not that many that are related to water bucks. Okay, we're going to drive up onto this waterhole wall and see if we can't find some other interesting things while we do that trailer. Taylor, not trailer. Taylor has got something interesting in the sand. I'm pretending to be a leopard while I'm walking exactly where a leopard was walking last night. You want to come and see what these tracks look like? I bet you do. A little bit bigger than your average house cat's tracks. We'll use this one as a very nice one over here. So, if you look very closely, you might be able to see... I'm going to draw it because it's a little bit windblown. It's been windy today. That is the back of the foot, there's a toe, there's a toe, a third one, and a fourth one. And it's going this way. That's the way that leopard was walking. And you won't believe it, this leopard came and visited us in camp last night. Do you want to see a photo? I think you will want to see a photo on how close this leopard came to camp. <sighs> Lots of bugs out today as well. It will take me two seconds to get the photo. It was so cool. It was really, really amazing. There we go. Let's go to media. Now, Tremaine, you've asked how can I tell? Look at this. Can you see that? Let's see if I need to angle it. So better. Look at that. That leopard is right outside one of the bedrooms. Actually, Rebecca, that's telling me all the questions at the moment, it was outside her room. How crazy is that? To have a leopard right close, and I'm pretty sure that these tracks are from that leopard. Now, Rebecca, you asked me something, and I didn't hear the name very well. Now, Tremaine, you want to know, how do I know if a predator is near me? Well, that's why on bushwalk you've got to concentrate. You've got to use your eyesight very well. You've got to use your hearing. And sometimes, some of the predators have got strange smells, so you can even smell them. But remember, the idea behind a predator is that they want to hide away. They don't want to always be out in the open because they could be looking for something to eat. So we might not see them. So maybe we're walking and you see a leopard up in a tree. Or maybe a group of impala are all of a sudden alarming. So they're snorting. They're shouting. They're saying, hey, there's something over there. And then you can look in the direction that those impala are looking at. 
and then maybe there'll be a lion or a hyena or a leopard. So we use the different signs out here to try and find predators. Otherwise, you look at the tracks, and that track is very old. We know it's from last night because the wind picked up early this morning, and it's been blowing all day. So these tracks have got lots and lots of sand on them at the moment. So we know they're not fresh. So you can also find the predators by following those footprints. But have a look. We've even got the largest land mammal footprints today. And that's these ones here, the elephant. The elephants were also very, very busy. This doesn't look like a big elephant, maybe a, a cow, but there were lots and lots of them. And I think that they were walking to go and have a drink to find some water. And not too far away from here, just over there, is a nice little watering hole. And I think that during the middle of the day, because it got very, very hot, I think that's where they went to go and drink. So they follow all the way over here. Look, they have an animal pathway. They're still walking. They go off the road. And then they start using their own pathway that goes all the way down there. So when you're in big as strong as an elephant, I'm so sorry, I turned my radio down, Rebecca. But when you're as big as strong as an elephant, um, you can walk wherever you like. The trees don't bother you. Please, can you repeat what you said to me? I didn't hear anything. I'd accidentally turned, to, turned it down. Ah. Oh, well, this is quite exciting. We've shown you footprints of a predator, of a leopard, but it seems as though James has found one that's not just a carnivore, but it also eats fruit. Right, hello everybody. This is a jackal. Now, this jackal, it does sometimes eat fruit, but it's got a cousin called the side-striped jackal that eats a lot more fruit. This chap is called a black-backed jackal, and he doesn't eat a great deal of fruit. He eats a lot of rotting meat. Doesn't that sound disgusting? So he'll go looking for meat that something else has killed, perhaps something like a lion or a leopard, and he'll try and steal food from them. Isaiah, you're wondering what happens if these animals get sick. Well, you know, they don't get very sick, Isaiah, because in this area, what you will find is that animals are able to deal with things that might make them sick. They don't live like we do in areas you, like you guys live in your classrooms, right? And if one of you is sick, you breathe the sickness all over the rest, and so everyone else gets sick, and then you have to go to the doctor. But there are not a lot of diseases out here that an animal like that can't cope with. So if they do get sick, normally they just recover. They don't get sick often. Sometimes they get sick enough, but there are no doctors here to help them. So then they either have to deal with it themselves or, unfortunately, they will die. But that's pretty normal out here. Let's have one last look at him. Isabella, you're wondering if that jackal is dangerous. No, that fellow isn't dangerous at all. If I was to get out of the car or drive too much closer, he would run away. Now, there are a whole lot of impala running in here. And remember, at the very beginning of the story, I told you that a big male impala would try and keep all of his ladies in one territory. Well, that's what's happening here. Those are all the ladies of an impala that is just off to the right-hand side of where I am. There we go. He's just chased them all into this area, and he's going to try and keep them here. And you can see that they're a little bit scared of the jackal. So even though that jackal is not dangerous to us, to a very small baby impala, he could be. Lele, you're wondering what species the jackal is. Well, the, the black-backed jackal is its own species, Layla. That is the species, black-backed jackal. He comes from the family of the dogs. But his species is black-backed jackal. That's what he is. And I'm not sure if you know this, but all animals have got a Latin name. And his Latin name is Canis mesomelis. Oh, Taylor's got something quite fun, and it likes to leap around. Look at this amazing thing we found in the grass. It's a stick, well, common stick grasshopper. Look how cool that is. Well, I bet you only know that there's something here because it's on my hand. 
And I only saw it because it jumped. And if it, ooh, no, no. If it didn't jump, I would never have seen it. Now I'm just picking it up very gently. Come here. Very gently. We will let it go again. Go onto my hand and be nice. So it's got a natural camouflage. So that's a word we use when animals try and hide away. And w without actually having to hide away at all. Because this grasshopper can sit out in the open on a piece of grass. and Or even on a stick of sorts. But typically the grass at the moment. Because you can see the nice colors that it has on it. It will blend in very, very well. And I'll put it on a piece of grass now. Now, this one can't jump very well. Even though it's got very, very big legs, you'd think it would be able to jump far. But it's a bit clumsy. It's not as fast moving as some of the other grasshopper species that we see. But watch how it disappears when you put it on a plant. We'll try and put it on a good one. He doesn't want to leave me. I think I found a new friend. Okay, that's fine. That works. Look at that. Almost completely disappearing. And you can see when that grasshopper jumps. So if it gets a fright and something scares it and it leaps away, it'll be able to hide away nicely in the grass. Almost completely invisible now. But I don't want to play with it too much. Very cool just to see, just to show you. And I bet that they're really delicious too because some people all or lots of people all over the world actually eat grasshoppers they're very good for you right james however has found my favorite animal in the entire world and it was from the animal the footprints we just saw yes we have we found an elephant we're very lucky we didn't find him he found us he came down towards the water but i don't know if he's going to drink so i'm just going to drive a little bit closer so that we can get a proper look at him in case he doesn't come all the way down to the water here he comes he's gonna pop out just over here oh he's going to be nice and close to us i think so remember you need to whisper can you believe there's an elephant really close to us now gabby you're wondering what my least favorite animal is gabby it's difficult to have a least favorite animal when you live out here because most animals are so lovely there is this beautiful elephant but i suppose something like a tick would be my least favorite animal ticks uh, and flies aren't very nice are they but they are animals and he's just quietly moving along that's a young male elephant quietly feeding and this time of the year is wonderful for this elephant because there's lots to eat for him there's been good rain which means that all the bushes have still got good leaves on them and there's lots of grass for him to eat and Gary I'm just you going to reiterate what I've just said there of course that elephants like to eat grass and leaves that's basically what he's eating and in February a few months earlier Gary this bull elephant would have been walking around these clearings here picking up a special kind of fruit known as marula fruits. And those marula fruits are very sweet and very delicious. But now he's on to plain vegetables. <laughs> Lele, you want to know if we normally see so many animals on safari? Well, not always, Leila, no. But often on a hot day like we've had here today, about, ooh, I think it was up to 87 degrees at one stage, uh, often if you come to water on a day like that, then yes, we will be able to see many animals and so that's what we did today we came down to this water hole and now we're going to follow this elephant down and see if he doesn't have a drink because he'll be quite hot and bothered and he will have to drink sometimes twice a day Nakim you very ask a very good question but I'm going to ask you to answer it yourself by looking at this fellow so let's get a bit in front of him your question is why do elephants have trunks well, let's look at this guy and let's see if you can figure out why he has a trunk. And I'll give you some clues as we watch him walk. There he 
goes. Now watch what he does with his trunk. Watch carefully. First thing to remember is that a trunk, of course, is a nose. So that's his nose, and it's very long. Now, what's he doing with it, Nakim? See what he's doing? He's picking things up. And he's picking things up with his trunk because he doesn't have hands. And so if he wants to put things in his mouth, he needs to be able to pick them up. But because he's so big and heavy, he needs four legs to walk. So how can he pick things up? Well, nature has very cleverly given him a special tool to do that, and that is his trunk. It's made his nose very long, and at the end of his nose, he's got two special kinds of fingers that are used to pick up small things, and that's why he's got a trunk. He's also going to use it like a straw now to drink. We'll just move, let's move quickly down to the water so that we can have a nice view of him having a drink. He might decide not to have a drink, but I think he'll drink. I don't want to give him a fright, so I'm just going to stay a little bit far behind him so that we don't get, make him scared of us. I know it's difficult to imagine that an animal should be scared of us, but, you know, this is a big noisy car, and so sometimes animals can be afraid. So I'm going to move away from him. just ask these impalas very kindly to just scoot aside slowly and then we'll gently make our way down to the water's edge and see what that elephant's going to drink with his long straw. Yeah, I think he should have a nice drink now. We'll just stop over here. There we are. Mm -hmm. Oh, my earpiece is out. I can't hear any questions you might be asking. Okay, there we are. I'm back in. Now, Madison, you ask a very clever question because I've just told you that female waterbucks do not have tusks or do not have horns. And so you're asking, well, do female elephants? And interestingly, you know, there are two kinds of elephants in the world, or three. We'll call it two for now. Some of them are in Africa and some of them are in Asia. And in Asia, the females do not have tusks. And here in Africa, all of the elephants have got tusks, both male and female. The female's tusks are normally thinner and longer, and the male ones have got fatter thicker sort of uh, stubbier tusks and I'm sorry it's you can probably hear there's a lot of noise coming from the wind today it suddenly got quite windy oh and Jaden you're asking a very good question you're saying what how will this elephant bull communicate with other elephants because you can't see any other elephants here so how's he going to talk to them well, they send a number of different signals. The first one is to make a very low sound. Now, you know when you're very hungry, your stomach goes sometimes. Well, elephants make a sound a little bit like that, not with their stomachs, but with their voices. And that sound, which is sometimes too low for us to hear, travels a long distance, apparently, up to about 15 kilometers, which is about 10 miles. I'm not sure if it travels that far, but they say it can. And so that's how he will talk to other elephants and he'll be able to hear other elephants all around by listening for those low rumbles. Ooh, suddenly it's got very, very windy indeed. Hey, let's see what this elephant does. Oh, now this is very exciting. One of the animals that is the most fun to see on walk is a giraffe, and Taylor has nearly caught hers. We're getting there slowly. We're much closer than we were a little while ago. But there's the giraffe, and he knows we're here. You can see he's looking straight at you. 
let's see what he's going to do, where he's going to go. He's basically just moving from tree to tree, trying to find the tastiest leaves that he can nibble on. And you can see, if he was scared of us, he would have run away a long time ago. But like I said, it's almost impossible to sneak up to a giraffe. You have got to be really, really sneaky to be able to do that. And I've been trying to do that ever since I started guiding, and I have not been successful. We'll have to ask James if he's ever been able to sneak up to a giraffe either. Now, Italiana, I'm not exactly sure how far giraffe can see, but what I can tell you is that one day... I was sitting with a group of giraffe, and we were also on bushwalk, and we were watching them from a distance. And then the giraffe all turned and started looking towards a mountain that must have been about a mile or two miles away. And I looked with my binoculars, because I had to use my binoculars to try and figure out what they'd seen on the mountain. And there was another group of giraffe all feeding on the slope. So they must be able to see pretty far. Now, giraffe don't really make any sounds. They sort of make sort of snorts and grunts and things like that. But like a lion can roar or birds can tweet. Giraffe don't really make many noises. They also hum, but not, not too many sounds. And they must communicate through body language. I think they see one another. Perhaps there's some infrasounds that we don't know about that they communicate through as well. So, so you know, maybe vibrations going through the ground, kind of like how elephants communicate with one, with one another. But otherwise, they're just looking at one another. And they're sort of going, hello, Fred. How are you doing? What's, what do the leaves taste like down there? I bet that, that's what those giraffe were saying to one another before they started the long journey. Anyways, right, I'm going to send you back across to Rolf now, who's found another family of warthogs. Yes, thank you, Taylor. And look at this, everybody. There's a couple of little piggies here. Well, three in, uh, just in the picture. And they're all just going down on their haunches, getting closer to the grass so that it makes it easier for them to eat it. And look at that one. He's very pretty, isn't he? He's been wallowing in the mud and getting the mud all over him in a little water hole. And uh, that helps to get all the ticks and, the, and uh, the little things that like biting him off. So he'll go wallow in the mud, lie and roll around in the mud. And then he comes out and he'll maybe go and rub up against the rock. And all those little ticks, those nasty pests will be uh, rubbed off of him. And look at that. They're very cute, aren't they? <laughs> Some would say they're very ugly, but that's Pumba and the family. Now, these warthogs are all grazing around with a lot of impala in the area as well. And these impala, they're more like your females. And I think James was showing you a male impala just now. And, and so these are all the females with, um, with no horns. So you see that, very pretty indeed. And they all stay together because then there's more eyes and ears. And so they can know if there's a leopard or a lion around. And then there's lots of them to be able to hear or smell or see the lion approaching. And then they can, um, they can all let each other know if that animal is coming. There's a little male there, or a little boy, you see with the small little horns on the top left of your screen. There he is. That's a little young male there. He's a little boy. He's probably about, you know, in animal terms, he's probably the same age as much of you kiddie boys in the group. And um, these, most of them are the adult girls. Okay, so from these very pretty looking animals and these ones that stay on the land, let's head you over to James with a scaly animal that lives in water. Oof, the scaly animal that lives in water. Look at him. Oh, he's caught something. What's he got there? What on earth is that? Can't be. He's just caught this. We heard a big noise and we came down here. And Senzor thinks it's the skin of a hippopotamus. It is. It's the old skin of a hippopotamus. 
I don't think that's very new. That's a big crocodile, though. He's very pleased with himself. He thinks he's very clever for courting, for having caught that. Let's see what he does there. So, I don't think that he managed to catch that hippopotamus. That's a big hippopotamus, and the crocodile's not big enough to do that. So, I think you'll probably find that a hippo died here, possibly in the water, and slowly the hippo has rotted. I don't know if you know what that means, but basically it means that it will disintegrate, it will, it will dissolve in the water, and eventually something like a crocodile will be able to eat small pieces off it. <laughs> so I don't think that he actually caught the hippo. Oh, there's another crocodile out there, yes. I wonder if it's the same one. Quite possibly. Normally there are only two crocodiles in here, but often it's impossible to tell. <gasps> Look at that. Joseph? You're wondering why alligators have sharp teeth. Well, it's so that they can catch things to eat. Remember, this is not an alligator. This is a crocodile. Crocodiles are much bigger than alligators. And they are a lot more dangerous. But you can see there why this crocodile has got such sharp teeth. And interestingly, you know, despite the fact that both alligators and crocodiles have got sharp teeth, they can't chew. So you can chew because you've got flat teeth at the back of your mouth called molars. And crocodiles are unable to chew. They've just got those long teeth for catching things. Sorry about the wind, everybody. I'm sure it's making a big noise. Very, very strong. Very interesting. Sorry, I missed that question. What was that? Oh, look at this. Ugh. Imagine that was your supper. know why he's trying to eat that. That's like eating a saddle. Very thick piece of leather. He looks a little bit like he doesn't know what to do with it, doesn't he? Ah, Italiana and Leila, I don't really know how to answer this question. You say, why do crocodiles have scales on their backs? Well, you know, they've probably got them because it makes their backs hard, which means that if they are attacked by other crocodiles, or lions perhaps, then they are protected. So I think you'll find that it will just help for them to be protected. Isn't that nice? exciting. We don't often get to see things like this, you know. One of you asked whether we see this many animals on safari always, and the answer is no. We don't have special times like this. I would say that this enormous crocodile probably weighs in the region 500 kilograms, which is about 1,200 pounds. So that's enormous. Isabella, you want to know if I've ever touched a crocodile? I have actually. I've touched a baby one that a friend of mine caught that it was stuck in a little river quite close to where he lived. and I touched it after he caught it. It was a very small one. And they feel they're very dry. People tend to think of reptiles like 
crocodiles and snakes being wet and slimy, but they're not. They're very dry and cool. Doesn't look like he's making much progress there, does he? Ah, now Jaden and Zaya, I told you that the crocodile this wasn't an alligator, but it was a crocodile. You wanted more detailed response into what the difference is. Well, it's actually difficult to to say the sort of um, the morphological differences, which means basically the, the the look differences, they look relatively similar. A alligator's normally got a slightly sharper nose, it doesn't have a round nose like that. Um, the teeth uh, operate in pretty much exactly the same way. Crocodile is bigger. Crocodiles live in Africa and in Australia and alligators live in America and obviously in South America. And basically they have slightly different diets where alligators will eat fish and probably small turtles and that sort of thing uh, whereas crocodiles like this will wait and ambush big animals sometimes like wildebeest and zebra and those are the main differences but otherwise you know they live very similar lives I don't know a huge amount about alligators because obviously we don't get any here but they live very similar lives and they you'll often find that in two places that are very far apart that have got they will often have similar animals because they ha can use similar strategies to feed themselves in those areas and a very good example of that is a hummingbird which you get in North America and South America when we don't get them here in Africa and a sunbird which we get here in Africa and they look very similar to hummingbirds but they're very different no Aubrey they don't you can see this one was not wanting to be in the water much he came wanted to sort of sit out I think onto the beach you say do they always stay in water they don't you know they're often out of the water especially when it gets cold and they don't uh, if they sit in the water for too long it becomes difficult for them to digest food it becomes difficult for them to move because they're what we call ectothermic uh, you can just use the term cold-blooded it means that they don't make their own heat they need to take heat from the sun so unlike you you are warm all the time you have a constant body temperature that crocodile has a body temperature that goes up and down depending on where it is so he's getting a bit cold now and I think that he probably wanted to come up onto the beach and sit there for a while and I think he wanted to sit there because he's getting cold in the water and Mrs. Brooks you're wondering if that crocodile will keep his eyes open all the time um, he will keep his eyes open most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, but he's also got a very special membrane called a nictitating membrane, which will help, uh, would basically will go over his eye in the same way that your eyelid will go over your eye, so it'll just moisten the eye, protect it, and especially when they're underwater, it protects it from damage under the water. It's called the nictitating membrane. Nictitating membrane. Ooh, and Gabby and Anthony, reptiles, you know, like this crocodile, are some of the most long-lived animals in the world. Some of them will live for more than a hundred years, if you can believe it, which is a very long time indeed. Much longer than a human being, even. So sometimes more than a hundred years. A hundred years ago, of course, it was 1918 which you'll learn in history was a very important year because it's the year that the First World War ended. So this crocodile was, well, I don't think he's 100, I think he's probably more like 50 or so, but conceivably he could have been alive when that happened. All right, everybody, thank you very, very much for joining us on our very special school safari. We will see you next time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at school. For the rest of you, we're going to hand you over to Taylor on foot. I'm going to see if I can find a leopard close by.
afternoon, everybody. To our regular viewers, welcome back. We look forward to asking your questions. Remember to hashtag Safari Live, or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat. We've also found the only zebra on Juma at the moment. I think it's a stallion. Just from looking at him at the distance, he's got his eye on us. We've got his eye on him. The Impala have all run away. Someone is snorting at us, but I don't exactly know who it is. Probably the wildebeest. Should we just take a few more steps this way so we can see a little bit better? It's, well, the planes are filled today, as you can expect on a very windy afternoon. I think everybody's a bit nervous, seeing as though Hosanna has been sprinting about. Last night, we've had his tracks everywhere, all over quarantine. There's been all sorts of things alarming, but that was also because there was a raptor of sorts flying around. The zebra's holding his ground, not really wanting to go anywhere. Where's the rest of your harem, buddy? Not around? No? Wildebeest aren't particularly impressed, but um, I think... I think the zebra knows. Maybe it's one of the long-lost members of the McCurdy Hurdy. For those of you that have no idea who the McCurdy Hurdy are, they were a group of zebra that I became attached to. And uh, I was inducted into the herd, if you will, last year sometime, where I spent many moments with them dust bathing as they frolicked as well in the golden light in the afternoon, sometimes on the misty mornings they were around. And they just seemed to allow me to get quite close. Now, I'm pretty sure if we walked 20 more meters in the direction of the zebra, it's going to sprint and run away. But perhaps if we just ignored it and we walked kind of to the left of us, sort of 6 o'clock, I reckon that we should be okay. I don't think we're going to startle them. The wildebeest are obviously going to run because the wind just changes direction and the wildebeest run. But we've got VM the wildebeest here today. Perhaps he will be able to we'll get them to settle down. Right, we're going to play around with these animals for a little bit. Might see some impala rutting. There's a lot going out on uh, the open plain. So off you go to Rolf to see what his plans are for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Taylor. And, well, you know what, everybody? I, I continued with my plan from this morning to go and check all the hyena dens. And we went to that old hyena den um, where, when I was previously on Juma, there was th that little uh, sickly-looking cub. It looked like it was uh, being left by the adults. And then um, it, it seemed like it was doing well and then not doing so well and then doing well. And I'm not quite sure what actually happened there uh, eventually. Um, but uh, it seemed there's no activity there either. So for now, um, at least we've got activity of hyenas in the area, but we're still not finding any den sites just yet. But that's uh, very similar to the story and the mystery of the um, elephants with the missing tails in the Maasai Mara. I haven't solved that one just yet, and I hope that that saga continues. But uh, for now, we've got a lot of hyena in the area. I know because we found them just behind camp sleeping this morning, but you know, they can travel such large distances that they're not necessarily daring on Juma per se. But keep looking and keep being positive that we will find. Now, I just want us to look up in front here, yeah, and it's always like that, isn't it? With birds, there was a little African wood uh, a hoopoe that was sitting on the road, and off he flitted. That would have been wonderful to watch. I think he was having a little bit of a dust bath, but maybe we'll see him just over here. Very pretty birds, and also very iconic as well. Very special. You can't mistake them for any other bird, but, uh, well, yeah, sometimes that happens, hey? As soon as we stop for an animal, it's very similar with giraffe as well. As soon as you stop for your guests to take a photo of a giraffe, um, as soon as you stop and you've got those three seconds for a giraffe to take his photo, otherwise uh, he's going to move off. So you must be very quick. You just remember that when you come on safari in Africa and you get to see a giraffe, take your photos very quick when you get close to one because they, don't, they only give you three seconds. Now, I'm still wondering where these elephants are. I haven't seen any. I know James has picked up on one. We are heading towards quarantine now. And we might even see Taylor and them on their bushwalk. But uh, I'm just trying to cross all the bases. And I'm going to be heading towards uh, Treehouse Dam in a minute. 
um, as I say we covering quite a large area and there's been lots of activity of elephant but they, they haven't been stationary they haven't stayed in the same place uh, after the marulas have now uh, dropped and almost all been finished it's only the squirrels that are still eating out the kernels out of the seeds that have been left by the marulas but uh, the elephants have all pushed off and just coming through in small little nomadic groups but um, might be able to catch up with one or two of them. Small breeding herds. So, as I continue on down to Treehouse Dam, uh, let's head you on back to James and see what cat he's searching for today. Well, um, we've, there is a cat here that you all know very well, and it is Hosanna. But unfortunately, he's inside Litligari, which is this reserve to the right-hand side of the road here. Uh, so we'll drive down. We might get a brief glimpse of him, but most importantly, we're going to lurk around here and see if he doesn't come this way. Yeah, he's just in here. Ravinda, you're wondering about Tandi and Tlalaamba and where they are and are they safe and sound? We think they're fine. We think they're on Torchwood, actually, on a kill, perhaps. But we're not entirely sure. But he, uh, she's fine. Both of them are fine. Yeah, he's just in here. And I'm afraid we cannot go in there. We are precluded by human laws. The animals are not and so they go in and we suffer anyway we'll stick around here and see if he doesn't come out I'll just check my map to see that we aren't trespassing <laughs> no we're not fantastic hmm. oh apparently the signal will disappear in here um, How's our signal now? Rebecca? Okay, I'm just going to go quickly through through this little dip. Oh, this car is fantastic. Rusty is doing a great job. I'm just going to get on the radio. Go ahead. So he's coming east. He's coming this way. Fantastic. Okay, copy that. Thank you. So we're going to go and wait on the road for him there. He wants to see us. You see, he heard we were coming. And he said, you know, all those people who have watched me since I was so little, we really want to see him. I really want to see them. I want to spend some time with those people. Right, while we sit on the road, which is not particularly attractive, let's go back to Taylor, who I believe is uh, tracking something. Tracking. I don't think I'm a tracking anything there, James. Oh, well, do you know what we are trying to do? Is we're trying to find a termite mound at the moment. I think it's that one where there are some mongies. Mongies that like to live there. Well, they have lived there once before. So we will go and inspect their home and see if there's any lizards that are now occupying the holes in the termite mound. It's just up ahead. We'll get there eventually. I've also been doing some gym activities today. I found a termite mound that was just the right size that I could run and propel off of it and do some fancy little trick over the top of those. I, I needed to get rid of some of the energy that I've acquired today. Okay, right, we're almost here. Now, Nandini, welcome. You're wondering where is this safari conducted? Um, we are currently in the Sabi Sand uh, in South Africa, so the northeastern corner of sunny South Africa, in, well, 
what I'm quite confident in saying, the best wilderness area that South Africa has to offer. We're bordering on the Kruger National Park, so we're basically part of the Greater Kruger ecosystem. Now, this is a termite mount, as most of you know. It doesn't seem to be too active. I'm hoping a black mamba does not come shooting out of one of these holes. Hang on, I found something even better. Wow, VM, do you want to come and have a look? It's exceptionally camouflaged. If you look very carefully, there is actually a grasshopper. I'm gonna, oh, no. ah, it's gone. I can't see it anymore. It's gone. Anyways, if you have it, there's a tiny little nymph of a grasshopper. VM can still see it. So he's going to show it to you. But it's perfectly camouflaged. And it's so small. Have we got it? There it is. Yeah, you've got it moving in center frame. No, center frame. Look how crazy that is. That is what we we're trying to show you. It's such a camouflage. I wonder if it's a type of a rain locust or something like that. They typically have this sort of mottled brown, gray coloration to them. And it's definitely still a youngster. It's very, very small. And that is really just incredible. I mean, I don't think anything would be able to see that. I don't even think a little mongoose that definitely have been living in this mound. And the reason how I know that they've been living here is because I can see all their feces just next to it, just all over here. That is incredible, though. Hey, the camouflage on these animals is just spectacular. So most of it doesn't look particularly fresh. Some of it over here looks a little bit fresh. But we can talk more about that in a moment. James is on the money this afternoon. He's found Hosanna. Look, there is our very special friend, Hosanna. And he's just going down towards the waterhole. Oh, I will, I will, I will, I will give it to him. Okay, wonderful. I'll definitely give it to him. All right, that was just one of the game drive guys talking to me. Let's um, get in here. Let's get in the mix, as it were. It's fantastic stuff. Now hold on tight, everybody. We're going to have to go off-road. Osana's 4x4, four four, slightly more effective than ours. He's going into his favorite spot down by the dam. Can you see him still, Sinzo? This tree. Three o'clock. Hey, you got him. Okay. Four o'clock behind us, apparently. Still moving? I can't see him. Let's go around here. There he is. Okay, he's going to walk out straight in front of us. Come on, old fellow. I haven't had a decent leopard sighting in a vehicle for a long time. Very lucky on foot the other day. Shall we just ooze forward a little bit, Sins? Has he stopped moving? Yep. Yeah. Very hungry to me. Like he needs a good meal. That scrub hair he ate the other day clearly has not satiated him. Marvelous. Got his ears on, he spotted something, he's seen something, he's backing up, he's backing up. What is it? It looked like he was quite afraid of it, whatever it was. No? 
guy seems to be on the stalk. Wonder if he didn't see another predator. What on earth he saw? Let's go around this way. I'm going to throw something out there and say, I wonder if he didn't spot Tingana. It was a very strange reaction. Unless it was a big prey animal like a kudu that he thought, I don't want to be... No, he's definitely stalking now. He's definitely stalking. He's got his ears flat. He's got his shoulders hunched. Let's have a look. He's going down into that sort of Hosanna's haunt area. Here he's coming past us. I'll just go a little bit forward so that the others can see as well. See if I can't get into a position where we can see him a bit better. Oh, sorry, everybody. This is going to get a little bit hairy. Let's just nip down here. Hold on tight there. He's not moving again. He's still sitting in the same place. There are a lot of trees in here. I can't see anything that he might be looking at. There's a little game path in here. Let's get down in here. All right, let's go back across to Taylor and a termite mound. I'll try and get into a decent position here so we can see. done James on catching Hosanna as he sneaks across the boundary. Right, we're still with our termite mound because we ventured on around the other side and guess what? We found more mongoose dung. How exciting. So, something really amazing uh, with mongoose uh, mounds uh, and termite mounds and mongoose put together is that you can actually try and help find direction. Obviously, don't use it as a definite, but all over the world, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. Well, hopefully. And uh, on the eastern side of the mount, when the mongoose will first rise and creep out of these little crevices, uh, they will they normally well, practice their morning constitution. And uh, you can see lots and lots of feces around here. And, and that will have all sorts of goodies. And we'll get into what they eat in a minute. And then on the other side, where we had that little grasshopper nymph of sorts or locust, you can see some more. So catching the first morning rays in the east and then catching the last in the west just before the sun goes down. I don't know if this, m this mound is still being used. Um, I can't see any sort of fresh sort of diggings or anything around here. And the dung doesn't look particularly fresh. It looks like a bit crusty, like it's been here for a little while. Then I found something else that was quite cool, which has now moved. I think I just saw it again. I just don't want to... Yes. Please don't jump. And these things are particularly good at jumping. My favorite spider. No. Oh, even better. I'm going to try to hold it as still as I can. The wind is blowing the leaves, though, as you can see. That is the most gorgeous jumping spider I have ever seen. I'm trying to rest the leaves on my hand without it kind of spotting me. It almost looks like it's encrusted in gold, don't you think? around its head like it's wearing a mound. It looks like it's tilted its head just up at me. Don't jump into my face because I will squeal. And it's quite a robust jumping spider. You can see the front legs are really quite large. Yeah, it keeps looking up at me. That's amazing. It's definitely focused on me. Right. But very cool little find. I'd like to try and identify this jumping spider. So send me screenshots. But Hosanna has arrived at James's car.
He is. He's just behind the car now. He's heard one or two birds alarm calling. And so he's lifted his tail in that little surrender flag that they put up. All right, here we go. Let's try and turn round. There's a very large Land Rover trying to get through this, <laughs> through this bush, which is quite fun. <laughs> Very grateful for our much smaller one at this stage. There he goes. Sorry about that, Senzo. Just took off his left arm with some thorns. He doesn't mind. And he's going to pitch up right around. Oh, is that the tyre? Is it okay? going to pitch up right around where we had him for that last episode of our TV show where he looked like he was sort of lying in a zoo. Ooh, there's an impala shouting at him now, just over there. leopard is irritated. He's disappearing down into the bushes. He's hunched down. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's here. And he missed that impala. He didn't see it. He can, oh, there we go. Now he needs a little lie down in some dirt. Okay, this is fantastic. Now sticking his tail up because there are some Chin spot battis is starting to shout at him. There's a very deep donga, deep hole ditch in there. We'll try and get down and through. <laughs> Joy, you're wondering if the human uh, white flag for surrender came from the leopard. No, I don't think it did. I think it predates our knowledge of leopards by some uh, by some margin. I don't know where it comes from, actually. Has he gone down? Okay, let's go around this way. You hear the birds still shouting, but you know, the temptation when birds and squirrels start shouting is to get right up to them and see what they're looking at. But their eyes are so good that quite often, you know, wherever they're shouting, they can see a predator miles away. And our eyes are just not quite as good and so we're not able to pick up what they're yelling at. Now there's a water buck looking this way. Going up to look down into the ditch. He knows exactly what's going on this water buck. He's fully clued up. See him anywhere there, Sins? See the, all the others coming round. We'll just pop down here. You could easily just arrive at the water hole, have a drink. Uh, Minamu, you're one. <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm laughing just now. Um, Minami, are you wondering what the difference between a sub-adult and a cub is? Well, a cub is still completely dependent on its mother. Uh, it's unable to survive on its own. A sub-adult is like a, a teenager, if you like. Any sight there? listening on the radio and oh, no, he's just back here we're right there on the left end apparently he's coming this way no we're not going to see him from this angle I suggest we just wait for him here He's now turned in that ditch and he's sort of coming back this way. Well, we 
we can try further forward. Uh, here are the chin spot battises that are shouting at him. Can you see the one little bird there? There? Right here. The leopard or the bird? Yes, now I've got the bird. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? They're such cool little birds. All right, let's go across to Ralph and find out if he's still alive. I haven't seen him or heard from him in hours. Everybody, sorry, I'm just listening to the radio here because we, we're very close to another leopard sighting. Um, and I think I've just come into the wrong block. So we're just trying to catch up with one of the other guys here. So just let me talk to him. Okay, okay, Gert, I'm just um, spinning around again. I'm gonna, I've obviously taken the wrong uh, tracks. So I'm just going to try and catch up with you on that side. So, very exciting. Give me a second because I didn't hear you last time. So let me just um, get onto that side of the of the road, and then uh, then we'll start up again. And I think it's Shudulu, so the same one that we saw this morning. So luckily we've been able to catch up with her again. That's great news, and that's why you haven't heard from me because I've been racing around trying to find out that we we got news that somebody had picked up on on her trail and then uh, we thought we'd come looking now ah there we are there we are there's sort of the vehicle going off the road so we'll just follow up over there there we are so you're coming in with us we're gonna find her now let's see where these tracks go we're gonna catch up with one of the other game drives Follow these tracks through the bush here. Going through here, try and go nice and quietly. She did disappear into Biffle's hook this morning, but she's obviously returned a little bit, so she's moving around quite a bit. But maybe we'll get lucky and see her hunting a little bit. Who knows? Uh, careful as we just squeeze past these branches here. The branches there on the camera. It's a little bit tight, but wearable we should be all right. Copy, thanks, Kat. nicely into the block so she and it was quite funny because we actually saw a whole lot of impala when we were watching those impala earlier that was where she was we were right there but we obviously just missed her now oh, huh? oh, there's the vehicle there okay let's just find our way through here let's just straddle this and it'll pop up behind us don't you worry she will be fine. It's popped up behind us now. It's a red bush willow as well. And there's a big log over there. Another big one there as well. Let's see, we might have to go over this one. That's the beauty of these Land Rovers. They really work well, hey? Don't want to try and break too much. We try and respect the bush as much as we can. Try and keep the tracks to a minimum okay everyone so we're gonna catch up here we're gonna get nicely into position when you come back to us I'm sure we'll be with Shudulu uh, but in the meantime let's head you back to Taylor with the damn cap We're playing games we're hiding from the damn cam at the moment I don't know they might spot VM but I don't know if they're going to spot me they're looking at us I think we've been seen. <laughs> I chanted, I don't know if any of you had the damn cam open, but I went ka ka ka, -ka trying to get somebody's attention. And it's worked. Hello! There, I surprised them. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so we've come walking down here. Wave, VM. We've moved away. Oh, they didn't even see us. Ah, oh, surprised out of the bushes and everything. Very funny. Oh, active termite mounds. Anybody been watching the termites work? We're so scared to stick my head over a termite mound in case something has gone inside. Anyways, looks like they've been working really, really hard here, as you can see, uh, for the last few days. I'm pretty sure a couple of hornbills would have come through and nibbled on it. Now, Claire, the soldiers and the workers don't of the termites don't typically live for very long, probably a couple of weeks, maybe some of the species, only a few days, maybe a few months. However, the queen of the mound, and I suppose it also goes upon... Oh, not upon, dependent on what species it is, but the queen can live up to about 35 years. So that's a very, very long time. And that's why it is so sad when something like an anteater or an aardvark uh, is successful and is able to claw its way down and find the chamber that the queen is in. Because if she's gobbled up, then the mound kind of follows with it and uh, end, ends up dying, which is quite sad because this is an exceptionally big termite mound, all built in and around here. Right. Now, obviously, you're very spoiled this afternoon with potential, well, Shidulu on the cards. Uh, hopefully, Ralph will get her. But James is already winning the leopard finding today. He's got another view of Hosanna. Yes, we are. There's his tail. Okay, copy that. Uh, he's static at the moment, looking towards that area. I'm just helping the guys on the radio. Sorry, my head is in the way. I do apologize, everybody. He's seen something in here. He's a magnificent cat, isn't he? Lou, I, I suppose you're asking this because I've told you he's just eaten a scrub hare and it look, is looking a bit hungry. And you say, how much hunting practice do they need before they take big game? I, I don't think that's possible to answer that question. Safe to say that he killed an adult male impala, I'd say, almost a year ago. So, you know, that, I mean, a year ago he was substantially smaller than he is now. Just hold on one second, sorry. He's now static in front of the vehicle here. Um, so, so Lou, he basically, I think they just, they, they have the instinct and some of them will try earlier than others, I guess. I mean, I have heard a story of a male leopard going for, you know, an adult giraffe climbing up its neck basically and dragging it down till it sort of fell over and broke its leg and I think that's extremely unusual and be very un unlikely that Hosanna will ever attempt something like that Jim, I think it's probably genetic. You know, you, your question is, are some better hunters than others? I'm sure they are. And you say, why? Well, I guess it's the same as human talent. Now, I mean, obviously humans have a range of talents that they can bring to bear on our current lives. But, you know, if you took us, say, 50,000 years ago or 40,000 years ago, you'd find that the talent uh, for hunting and uh, sort of the ability to be big and strong and have great eye-hand coordination would have made a big difference to our survival rates, which means those sorts of skills would have uh, probably been more common than they are now in the human population. Now, any, uh, any animal like this who has got poor hunting talents is just going to die, and so he won't survive. But, you know, some will be really good at killing big game, so big adult male impala, and they'll probably eat slightly more than somebody, than a leopard that's only able to kill smaller things. But there are risks involved in that. Uh, and so while I'm sure there is some sort of genetic difference, the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think it's anything like as big 
as the talent difference that you find in human beings for different things. Right, Senzo has now had enough of me being parked in this position. You said you need to move around. Okay, Senzo, we'll move around. Oh my goodness, our cup really doth run over. Well, everyone, this is absolutely wonderful. We've we've caught up with Shudulu, and um, she did start to do a little bit of stalking. Now, I don't know what she spotted, whether it was a daika or something in the thickets there. Uh, she started stalking, but she's gone a little bit uh, relaxed now, so I think she may have given up there, a bit of grooming going on. What a beautiful cat she is, eh? Absolutely stunning. So... Well, we're going to try and keep up with her. We're going to have to do a little bit of bundu bashing here. We don't want to lose her. So I might have to go back and just quickly try and catch up with her. So we're going to have to keep all our skills here because we can't get too far behind. Luckily, she's got her tail up a little bit. So we can see that white tip on the end. That gives us a little bit of a flag, something to follow. But we also want to give her enough space that we don't disturb her. There she is. Just see that little white flag every now and then. I think she's turned this way. There she is. So she is in a bit of a hunting mode. Nandini, you're wandering around uh, their character and if it sort of affects their, their hunting, well, it, it definitely does because, you know, they're going to take on different kinds of prey um, according to their character and, you know, they'll be a little bit more bold um, if, they're, if they're a stronger character. If they're a less strong character, they maybe go for things a little bit smaller or take less chances. There she's back on the road now, so we'll be able to see her nice and clearly now. I don't know anything about this Shudulu, but she's in prime condition, so um, I'm just going to get you onto the flat and then we'll switch off. There we go. That's a lovely sight, that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. And we're the only vehicle with her for the moment, so we can just follow her as we please. Beautiful cat this is. And a hungry hunting cat. I don't know how long she's been hunting for, but she's definitely hungry. So this makes for an interesting afternoon drive then, hey? We're going to stick with her as, as long as we can, as long as she stays in the property, and as long as we can keep up with her. Always lovely to look at the way that they walk as well. Bit of marking. Now, Zev, around the territories with leopards, they can try to obviously keep their young or their offspring in the same territory that they are in, but it all depends on the dynamics. Oh, look there. Looks like she smells something. She moved in the bush there, so I'm going to try and catch up. So, Zev, yes, absolutely, she can. They will attempt to try and keep... Um, like Tandi would try to keep, you know, uh, the little Tlalamba in the same territory, um, but it all depends on the dynamics of the rest of the leopards in the area. So, yeah, I'll just stay here just for a second. We just keep following. I have to move and stop so that we can get a good picture. I can't always just keep driving, otherwise Ferg's going to really want to punch me at the end of it because he doesn't get to get that, that square picture. So I'm going to go forward. So everyone, I'm going to try and keep up with her. Let's let's hope that she. Oh, sorry, Ferg. Let's hope she, that she um she starts to get on the hunt. But while we catch up with her, let's head you back to Taylor with some very interesting little arthropods. Look, look, we've got a velvet ant. It's coming towards you now, Viem. 
There it is. It's quite a big velvet ant, too. Now, most of you know that this is the female version of a stingless wasp, and they are incredibly tough creatures. That's one of the most amazing things about these, uh, these little guys, is it's scared. Can you see it? Oh, we're just going to help you out. Just, we want to just see you a little bit. Oh, my. It's hiding. It's terrified of us. I promise you we won't eat you. Now, I've accidentally stood on top of a velvet ant before. I'm going to see if I can lift the leaf up. Is it not there? And obviously I got a fright because I heard a crunching sound and I immediately lift my foot up. I didn't realize what I'd just done. I'm trying to figure out where it's hiding. I also don't want to get stung by it. And anyways, basically what this little velvet ant did was it shook itself off and uh, carried on walking. It was amazing. I don't know how it just did that, but they've got an incredibly tough exoskeleton. And that's, of course, to try and protect them from sort of predators. And if they are moving around, uh, I know they do like to parasitize ant larvae. Those ants have got very, very strong pincers. So they kind of need a strong... <sighs> Beggar's laughing at me. The wind is blowing my wispy bits. I need to get lots of pins in my hair. But um, there's just nothing, nothing, not even hairspray can control this mane. Nothing. I, even a hat doesn't work. So I was eating my hair for a moment. And I get so used to it just sticking to my face, kind of like that, that it doesn't even bother me anymore. But yes, Rebecca, I used coconut shampoo, so my hair was very tasty today, just in case you were wondering. Rebecca was sassing me in final control. It's not even sass today just yet. What day is it? Thursday. What is Thursday? What day can we give? Thirsty Thursday, says VM. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with... No, it can't be Tiger Thursday because we don't get tigers here. Thursday. Thursday. It could be Thursday. But... Um, Yes, maybe it could be that. <laughs> right. I've been told I've been enough nonsense from me, and I'm getting scolding in my ear. Off you go. Back to Shidulu, who's looking ever so regal. <laughs> Uh, very regal she is looking indeed and I must say that this is my new favorite cat um, I, I did uh, have a little soft spot for uh, Tandi which I still do because she was the first uh, cat that I saw on Juma on my interview drive uh, but now on bushwalk I found uh, Shudulu and now we found her immediately after again on the afternoon drive what luck hey so well I hope I can spend some more time with her and maybe we can, maybe hopefully she'll stay on Juma and uh, we can spend some more time with her. That'll be wonderful. She seems to keep disappearing back off into Biffle's Hook, but she's come now a little bit deeper, a little bit more south into the concession. So let's see if she hangs around or if she disappears back into the northern side. But she's definitely looking for something to eat very aware and she keeps on sniffing the air and every now and then she picks up a scent of something um, antelope wise you see how she keeps raising the head that's just some Franklin behind us crested Franklin wow look at those eyes eh? she's quite a an angry looking female she's not very soft eyes she's quite a and those eyes are quite tough eh? And when I showed the photos to my family from this morning, and I was saying, wow, she looks angry with you. And I said, well, she was quite relaxed, but very angry looking eyes. But uh, I like those kind of eyes. It just shows she means business. And that's how a leopard should look, I, I think. Everything about them should just mean business. <laughs> They're just pure power killing machines but they have a soft side to them as well as you would have seen with Tandy and little cub but in this frame of mind she is now looking for food so now I think from one leopard to another but from a female to a male look at that Wow Let's head you off to James and Hosanna, who's doing something similar. 
So we've managed to catch up with him. He sat in a little thicket for a while, and now he's come out of the thicket and he's exactly where we saw his father. Oh, what was it, about a week ago now, in this area, just behind the waterhole. Hey, I'm not sure it's lately. I think it's been for some time. You say, why has he been following Tingana lately? I'm going to move forward. Um, it's because, Ali, he seems to have this very strange uh, desire to be around other leopards. Uh, I've, it's very odd. It's not common. I've never seen it before. But he does seem to seek out his father. We may be spending the night here, Senzo. Hold on. There we go. Thank you. Mine is light enough, yes. You'll get a really nice view here. If you want if you want to come down here. I'm just telling that to Sheldon. I'm just not sure that I can get out of the way. There you go. You can have a look there, everybody. <laughs> Phew. That would not have been possible in one of those heaving things we drive around in the Mara. Is he not a magnificent fellow, this? See, he was just giving me a little wink there. And so special that we followed him from the day he was born, when Brent found him, or we found him and his mother and his sister. Rest both their souls. And uh, it's unusual for me to find a female my favorite leopard, but I really did do miss Shongile, his sister. She was my absolute favorite. Um, sorry, I missed the name, Rebecca. <coughs> Never mind. Uh, Gemma, sorry. Gemma, you're wondering if Shadulu is his sister. Shadulu is not his sister. Shadulu is, as far as I'm aware, unrelated to him. I don't know enough about Shadulu, or she used to be the Ingrid Dan female, uh, to know whether or not they are maybe distant cousins, it's possible. All right, well now let's try and go backwards through the same area. We might have to be pushed. Whoa. And apparently Shidulu is up on a Shidulu and she would like to talk to you. Oh dear. Thanks, James. Up on a Shadulu she is, and she's just spotted and heard some impala rutting just over on the other side of this little drainage line. So, and the wind is perfectly in her favour, um, and it's wonderful how we can go between James and Hosanna and us with Shadulu um, as the visuals come and go. So, let's just hope she is really in a hunting frame of mind, and uh, let's see. And those. Impala rutting on the other side there, or a male trying to keep the females within his little group. Uh, just over the other side there, as Ferg pans, we, we're looking just over the other side over there. That's where those Impala are running around, being a bit silly. And when they're doing that, you know, they, they're sort of up and down through there, and she heard them, and she sat up immediately. And so if they come back down, that was where they were, in that open patch just there that Ferg's come past. So... Every, oh, where's she gone? She's just gone down. Ah, oh, there's the tip of her tail. Sure, I've got a surprise. I was looking out the other side. They're so quick, eh? Hey? So I don't know if she lay down or if she's just crouched down and maybe getting ready for a little hunt. But at least she's leaving us a little sign there, a little flag, the top of the Shudulu. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Shadulu. <laughs> yes, that is a leopard. Um, you, know, you wouldn't know it if we hadn't seen her before. A bit of grass, a bit of Shadulu on a Shadulu, and a white fluffy tail. And that's uh, now not the best visuals that we've got, so I might actually start up and try and see if we can get a better angle on that, folks, because for all we know, she could disappear. So, here we go. A bit of bundu bashing once more, as we say in South Africa. Let's get around. Maybe we can get a bit of a front. Okay, everyone. While we just try to reposition, she's now just gotten up, but um, I'm going to just try and get into a better position a little bit. Uh, let's head you back to James with the sauna and I think with a little bit of a puddle or so, I think. Well, he's gone over his puddle and he's now making his way out, I think, onto the road behind. I'm just going to tell Sheldon, who's been very kind, he's from Chitwa, and he's been helping us here. Sheldon, he's crossed over. If you just keep coming and stop in about 20 meters, I think he's going to come out there. He stopped pretty much where you are now, but in the drainage. Yeah, it looks like, he, looks like he's coming through. All righty. There we go. Let's just make it sure I can move again. He did this sweet little jump over that puddle over there. Naturally, I missed it with my camera because I'm the world's slowest photographer. Yeah, he's gone around there. I think we're going to have to... I think we're going to have to go around back towards the dam because not even this little car is going to make it up here. Yeah. So he's gone into that little area there and we're not going to be able to see him. Okay, let's go back to Taylor. Apparently she was going to show you something known as her sparkling personality. Hello. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> Rebecca just asked me what I had, and I didn't have anything. But I have a tree now. We do indeed have a tree. We have got a large fruited bush willow over here, which is being devoured by something. I don't know what caterpillar is eating it, or if it's a leaf mine or something. And There's something else happening here. I don't know if it's a fungus that it's got on this tree, but it doesn't seem to be particularly healthy. Really interesting. It also has been chopped by a punga, as you can see from Exhibit A over here. Obviously some branches creeping into the road, but this, of course, will have no effect on the little holes in the leaves of this tree. Now, for those of you who don't know what a panga is, perhaps James or, or, or um, Rolf will be able to show you, because they should have one in their vehicles, but it is like a machete. Machete, you all know what a machete is? It has a handle, and it's a big flat piece of metal that is quite sharp. Not a sword but you can use it like a sword. I normally do and do things like that when I'm chopping bushes. I think I've showed you before how I use mine like a sword. It's very dangerous though. You can see, okay, here's more evidence that there are caterpillars plaguing this tree. I'm going to do some pruning of my own. Bye! There was Steve Ovo. Look at where he's going. Have a look inside here, Viam. Here's some caterpillar fresh, fresh. My absolute favorite thing to talk about, caterpillar poop. But what caterpillar is doing this, I'm not certain. Um, Paula, yes, there are bagworms in South Africa. A couple of bushwalks ago, we were able to find one. We're always looking out for them. Um, I haven't seen one for a while, though. I don't know if we will still be seeing too many of them as we're coming into winter now. So majority of the insects that need to pupate are going to get that pupating process done by the time it gets too cold. Obviously, they've eaten as much of the vegetation as they can while it's the most lush. And, and then, well, the insects aren't too active or aren't as active as what they are. And a lot of them, in fact, have died because their life cycles are not typically very long. So we're just off of the road. We're actually right here by the DRC. We're going to go and investigate around the tent and see what we could find. But um, I need to find out what caterpillars are feasting 
upon the large fruited bush willows. Ooh. Now, Kia, we see lots and lots of different types of caterpillars. Let's see if we can find one for you. We see caterpillars from the um, uh, vagrants. Uh, basically, they like to go and sit on the center bushes. And then we see caterpillars from the, well, what else do we see? African monarchs. Actually, I saw... I'm going to find you some African monarch caterpillar larvae, but you have to come with me. We've got to go into camp. I don't know. Rebecca, do we have signal in camp? But there's a tree outside our kitchen that I saw was filled. Okay, we've got to walk. So you're going to walk with me. We're going to walk quickly, have you? Brisk walk. We're going to march. We've got a little way to go, but stay with us. We'll name the caterpillars along the way. We're going to go back of house now, though. And uh, I'm going to... Well, you don't have to come with me, Bex. It's not particularly pretty. It's up to you. We can get back. We can talk more about the caterpillars when we get there. Okay, we're going to march into camp, and I'm going to see if I can find you some African monarch larvae while we do that. Uh, Shidulu is still with Ralph, and hopefully she's not going to give him the slip. Yes, we are still with her, everybody, and she is now really on the hunt. She spotted some kudu off in the distance, but I think they might be a little bit big for her. She's moving now into the area where those impala were, and really on the hunt, eh? Look at that. So, this might be our lucky day from seeing her this morning. Uh, I think she's now spotted that it's kudu. Possibly. What was that? Either that, or she's picked up a scent of maybe another leopard. Something really turned her around there. On the button, she stopped and turned around immediately. And it was like she smelt something, the way that she was flexing her mouth. Very interesting, that. How she stopped and turned around, unless she thought maybe she was a little bit too exposed. Let's just see what she does. We're going to follow her. Let's start up and move up a little bit. This is very nice now because she's also going into a very open area. So nice and clear for us. It's not as thick as it was earlier. I think she may have seen that those, those animals are a little bit too big for her. And obviously if she goes in a bit too close and they spot her, they'll give away her position. That kudu is a bad animal for a, for a leopard to... Um, get spotted by because they make such a booming bark that uh, the, the whole area here is going to know that there's a leopard around here and everybody will go on high alert so she doesn't want to let those kudu know that she's here serious stealth going on and a leopard moving through the bush like this very difficult to see if we didn't know that she was here, we would never be able to spot her just from randomly driving through the bush. Except with that little white fluffy tail. That's always a little bit of a giveaway. It's normally how I've spotted leopard in the bush. Just by seeing that white movement on the tail. And there might be a nice little two-shot with the sun in the background. But we'll go in on here and have a look. They're totally focused. Still on the move, still trying to identify a target. It's moving into the breeze. Everything is lining up for her. She just needs to get the right target. Which those kudu are not. They're way too big for her. But they're also potentially going to give away that she's here. So that's why she's staying low as well. Maybe also why she moved off pretty much straight downwind of them now. So there's no way that they could pick up her scent. Kia. There is every uh, possibility that she could be pregnant, but um, you wouldn't know until the very late months, or the, the very late uh, yeah, months before she's going to give birth, um, because cats don't really show 
uh, if they're pregnant, you know, they still need to hunt. And so the little cubs are very small and it doesn't really last that long either. Now look at her. Oh, she's starting to focus. She's really coming straight towards the vehicle, almost using us as cover. So we're just going to go a little bit quiet now. We don't want to disturb her. She's also listening out. So I'm not quite sure if she's pregnant, but there is every possibility that she could be. It would be very interesting to know if she was pregnant, who would be the father. And if she's in this area, and she would be presentable for, for mating, who, who would actually cover her? That would be very interesting to see. Oh, lovely yawn there. Looking straight at us, she's probably about 10 meters away from the vehicle. Quite close. Very habituated, hey? Not, you know, there's not many places in the world that you can enjoy leopard sightings like this in this part of the Sabi Sands. Oh, the guides have done their work so well in habituating them with the vehicle. She's now starting to come just towards the back of the vehicle, as I said, almost using us as cover. There we go. She's now going around the back. I oh, going to have to spin around. She's gone right behind us. And she's actually heading straight towards those goodies. Look at her. She's totally focused. That's a big prey to take on, love. Also like that little white tail on the end, always like a little rudder. Minamu, the leopard, is one of the most efficient killers of an animal because they want to kill it very quickly. So it's mostly to do with the teeth and getting in under the throat and throttling it. But they will use the claws to grab onto the animal and immediately go for the throat. And they want to kill it as quickly as possible and move it off because it can very easily give away her presence to other predators. And then they can come in and, and attempt to either steal the, the prey or even kill her or anything. So she wants to stay absolutely underneath the radar so kill that animal as quickly as possible get it uh, under cover and possibly even get it up a tree and there are a couple of birds coming around there's a, a couple of long-tailed shrikes one of them just gave an alarm call but only once it just went a crack so yes and i mentioned that there was an alarm call but it's very windy so that's why you wouldn't have been able to hear it. See how that grass is moving? It's very breezy at the moment. It's almost like there's a little bit of, of, a, of a system coming in. It's, it's been quite windy this afternoon. It was very hot this afternoon, uh, earlier, at about around midday. It was uh, you know, in the 90 degrees Fahrenheit, around 32 degrees centigrade. But uh, it's cooled off quite substantially now. First lady, they definitely do prefer a uh, thick bush. Now look there, there's the target that I think she's spotted. But there's too many animals around there. Uh, leopards, they, they, they're very good ambush hunters, first lady. So and they like to be in the thick stuff. So when it's a little bit open like this, at least there's some long grass. But um, she'll use cover to get through to those animals there. But as I say, a little bit open here. And you see how she... Uh, that's where the term comes from, leopard crawling. Uh, she may have got a little thorn there. And she's just pulled out with her teeth. And they're not immune to thorns. They do have quite soft pads. But she's not quite leopard crawling just yet. She's doing a half leopard crawl. But still staying underneath the radar. Using cover all the way. And that little irritated or fidgeting tail says to me how she's really focusing but that uh, that tail always indicates the mood when you when you're on foot 
it's the same with lions. You do um, you you watch the tail of cats, and it indicates their mood. So even your house cat at home, you can watch its tail. When it flicks from side to side, it's an irritated cat. And when it flicks up and down, it's um, ready to pounce. Now. I think we're going to reposition soon and see if we can get a little bit of a head of her and watch her coming in and uh, from one cat to another but this one has got a pillow on it over to Taylor. <laughs> it's the most descriptive way I've ever heard a caterpillar being described uh, but here we go here's the larvae of the African monarch butterfly which was quite cool. Now it's not eating um, the papyrus that it's on. Vim, I'm holding your cup now because I wanted to show you. It's feeding on this plant over here. Now, this also grows on the wooden fence kind of surrounding the DRC, so that's where we live. And I have no idea what it actually is, but it does have a milky latex, so it's toxic of some sorts. Now, perhaps it's a type of milkweed. However, I know milkweed not to look like this, not to be a creeper, and you can see how it's creeping along. Um, so I, I don't really know what it is, but I suppose if it's got similar toxins to that of the milkweed, the African monarch larvae will be able to harvest it and, and store it, which of course, so not only is this youngster toxic, but the adult is of course toxic too, which is pretty cool, but they're the most dramatic ca caterpillar. Now, oh, hang on, it's a bit prickly. This is the front of it from what it looks like over there. It looks a bit deceiving. Is it the front? Hang on. No, I talk nonsense. Here's the front with these long protruding little things. Now, I think I'm just searching for the plant here and so we won't disturb it too much. But like I said, the other day this sort of area was infested with these larvae, which is really quite cool to see. And although it's course those dramatic coloration, we know it's aposematic coloration, and uh, that's to, of course, ward other predators. They'll know not to eat this caterpillar, which I suppose is why it feels so comfortable to be out in the open like this. That was really cool. I'm trying to see if I can find some more because we're in camp at the moment. And I have VM's juice. Here's VM. Look, VM has got juice. We st oh, Rebecca, please can I have that all again? I didn't hear what she said. I'd somehow turn my radio down. I've been good at doing that today. Now, Pangolin, you've asked, as I hold VM's cup of juice, because we were at camp and we thought, why not quench our thirst while we're here? <laughs> You're wondering if, um, and I'm not supposed to say that, sorry, let me weave this into my narrative quite easily. Um, I don't know if this is a morning glory vine. I've never seen any flowers on it. I don't know if the morning glories are toxic and have a milky latex to it. Let me break a, a bit of this vine. The other thing we did is that we scared Darby to death. You need to put the cup down. It was quite funny. It was in the kitchen scavenging. Oh, there we go. It's all leaking out now. Can you see that? So there's the milky latex we're talking about. And uh, I went, I just, I don't actually know what I did. I don't know if I said anything, but he jumped like he'd been caught, like a naughty kid doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. It was really quite funny. I don't know. I've never seen flowers on this vine, but um, I don't know if I would say it's a morning glory. Vine. Let's see if we can find any more around here. No, I'm not going to eat it, Rebecca. I'm definitely not going to eat it. Okay, well, we'll see if we can find some more. Otherwise, we will start a list of what caterpillars occur in this area. But let's go back to James and see what Hosanna is up to. Uh, he's up to absolutely nothing whatsoever. He's just lying there doing, uh, well, a bit of ear flicking, but... Otherwise, the entertainment value of this cat has plummeted somewhat since his uh, initial appearance. But I think that it might be worth waiting with him. He might go and do something useful in the last hour of the drive or so. So I think we'll probably sit with him uh, a bit longer, if that's okay. So he's not going to do anything just yet, but I suspect he'll co get up as it gets darker, come and have a drink, and maybe go off on the hunt, which will be very exciting. There's one other vehicle here with us. 
Well, they don't have a better view of him either. So I'm afraid, for now, Orsana's entertainment value is as you see it. Fairly slim pickings, but we have a leopard in sight. And my goodness, one should not uh, look askance at that. Now, Bobby, you're asking about this leopard and when he will breach sexual maturity. I suspect that in a, an area where there was no competition from other males, uh, where he could become territorial almost immediately, you'd find that about two and a half years he could probably conceivably uh, impregnate a female. In all likelihood, however, this, that will only happen for him when he's five or six. Uh, it happened for his brother, a Quarantine, when he was four, I think. Uh, but normally five or six, but conceivably, I mean, he would be sexually mature probably from two and a half years. But he has to earn his stripes before he gets the right to mate. And so he's got a long time before he's able to find himself a girlfriend. Um, Pangolin, it's very difficult to answer this question as well. You were saying how much would he want to eat per day on average? How much meat would he need to eat per day? Uh, you know, they don't, they're not daily eaters, first of all. They're not sort of rhythmic eaters like we are. And they are very irregular eaters. I would say, on average, if he killed, let's pretend he killed an adult male impala, which weighs in the region of 60 kilograms. Uh, let's say of that 60 kilograms, probably 30 kilograms or so are actual edible meat. I would suggest that that would last him a good four days before he'd want to eat again or n need to eat again probably in about a week uh, want to eat or try and eat again in about four days so let's put it 30 k k kilograms every four days or so uh, so that's 15 kilos a day that's a, no it's not it's half of that it's seven and a half kilos a day that's quite a lot i i would have said i would have said uh, you know f f to maintain optimum optimum health is he, he's not moving is he that's just the vehicle uh, to maintain optimum health let's say six or seven kilograms of meat a day but i could be wrong that makes sense i hope so the vehicle is moving now i don't think the cat is moving i think the guests have just become bored oh my goodness there's huge action here look at that his head is up right i believe that there's even more action happening with ralph and shadulu so let's go across there Yes, the action is actually just um, making my heart uh, palpitate at the moment. Uh, but she's gone down and she's just biding her time. The wind's still perfectly in her favor, but I'm not sure she's that confident that she's going to make this happen. And it looks like she's now relaxing in, in that position. And I think Ferg's just telling me there's some impala running in the background there. So. I wonder if squirrels or a swirling wind or something has given her position away and she's now, she's blown it. Something's happened that uh, has really made her now just give up. Because you see in her position, in her body language now, it's all relaxed. And... Uh, Oh, there we go. There's the Impala off in the distance there. They haven't disappeared off completely, but they're very alert. Look at that. He knows there's something up. So something has given away her, probably her scent. But I don't know if he knows exactly that there's a leopard over here. She's now completely behind the cover. He won't be able to see her. It must have been a scent. Maybe a little bit of a swirling wind. Something is indicated to him, and now the kudu are running off as well. So something really told them that something's up, and um, well, that's the reason why they've made it to that age, by being very alert and knowing exactly that kind of smell that a leopard gives off, or their kind of alarm calls. We did hear a couple of squirrels 
alarm calling and sounded like alarm calling and I wonder if that might have given her away and uh, well now we've got two flat leopards in Hosanna and Shudulu well she's just now going to do some maintenance Byron to answer your question um, uh, leopards don't really sleep as much as lions no they can move around during the day uh, they move around at night you see, she's she's still in a hunting mode and lions for me are one of the laziest cats sleeping up to 20 hours a day 18 to 20 hours a day on average so they can sleep sometimes the entire day whereas leopard a lot more active I would say but, uh, Let's, let's see with this. Now, there's some Franklin now making a racket in the background as well. You see now her focus has changed direction too. She's now looking in the opposite direction trying to see if maybe there she can identify a target this side now. But it would be a little bit more difficult with her walking with the wind. It would give away a position much quicker. Yeah, well, exactly. I hope we're not the target, but I, I, I did seem to think she was looking under the vehicle. I hope she's not looking at Fergie. He, he does look like a tasty morsel, uh, but uh, yeah, I hope she leaves us alone. Well, she's relaxed now, so we can calm down, Ferg. No worries.